Well, today we are back in uh, the book of Haggai. We said Haggai is uh, really a book for immigrants. It's a book about people moving to a new land, starting over with a new life. They go off with great hope and anticipation, and they arrive there, and re- they realize it's an awful lot more difficult than they were anticipating. And in the midst of all those challenges and difficulties, they realize that uh, they don't seem to have uh, uh, the time that they might have otherwise had for God, and he seems to get lost in the mix. And into the midst of that kind of situation, God speaks to them. He gives them a series of dated messages, and uh, we uh, we began last time looking at those messages, and we will be uh, continuing with another one of those messages today. Uh, today's looks at the glory on the other side of small beginnings. I, I read this week of a, a documentary featuring the uh, interviews with World War II veterans. Uh, it was talking about uh, how they spent a, uh, a particular day asking just what it was like and uh, just getting firsthand reports of uh, what they experienced. Uh, one of the soldiers uh, said that uh, they sat in a foxhole and uh, took a couple shots at uh, passing tanks. Uh, others played cards as they tried to pass, pass the time. Uh, some found themselves in quite a, uh, a, a dangerous firefight, and they gave uh, some recollections of that. But for the most part, many people described what felt like just an ordinary day at the front lines. Nothing particularly uh, that stood out about it. It just felt like another day. And the peculiar thing is, so it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't just another day. Uh, the day was December 26, 1944. Uh, it was uh, at the height of one of the most, or probably the most decisive battles in World War II, known as the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, it was that decisive a day that an important, a turning point in the war, but most of the soldiers weren't aware of it. Just felt like an ordinary day. And I think most of us, if we're honest, we go about days that feel very ordinary. We, uh, we go into days with small decisions, small challenges, small opportunities, maybe small ministries, and it just feels a little small. And because it's small, we can have a small motivation, uh, small thoughts about uh, uh, things that are happening that create in us uh, a bit of uh, maybe apathy. It, it creates a sense of uh, not having uh, big expectations. Well, today's passage looks at these Jewish exiles who were serving in a small, underfunded, Uh, very mediocre feeling uh, project that they were finding hard to get motivated about. It was difficult for them to think about it because it just didn't seem like it mattered all that much. And as they went about their work, there were difficulties as there are difficulties in just about everything. And as a result of those difficulties, they found themselves um, wondering, should we even bother? Is this worth the effort? What God said to them made all the difference. And I think we need to hear it uh, in our lives today, in the challenges that we face, and in the life of our congregation. So I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Had had, um, some some honest people uh, um, confessed to me after last week, when you called out Haggai, I wasn't sure where to find that in the Bible. Uh, we're in the Old Testament. It's a few books uh, from the end of the Old Testament uh, in the Black Church Bibles and the Rack and the Seat in front of you. It's page 743. Maybe that's the easiest way. You just grab for the Bible, do so with confidence, do it to 743, and you don't have to worry that you can't find uh, that book. Um, but we'll be walking through uh, the first nine verses of chapter 2. Haggai 2, verses 1 to 9. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, 
and say, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is the word of God. Now, the first takeaway from this passage is that without the big picture, when we lose sight of what is going on, we often find ourselves feeling like it isn't worth it. Uh, When we lose sight of what God's doing, we become discouraged and unmotivated. And so it is helpful for us to step back and to to assess what, what, what God is doing and where this fits in. Without the big picture, it doesn't feel worth it. Now, all of, one of the things that's unique about Haggai is that all of the messages that God gives to the people are, uh, are dated in the book, and the dates help us to put everything into context. Uh, this particular message was given on the seventh month, on the 21st day. Uh, we said last time it's 520 BC, and so this is after the Jews had gone into exile, now they're returning from exile and uh, because they t- they've told us it's the 21st day of the seventh month, um, we know that that's October 17th on our calendar. Um, but this is about a month after the building began on the temple. So a month after last week's, uh, uh, the end of last week's message. So they begun work on the temple. You know that the first job in any renovation, construction project is demolition and excavation. It's a time on the uh, home renovation show where they have the people get out their sledgehammers and they, they do this. And, and if you take a couple swings with, it, with a sledgehammer, it's fun, right? It, it feels like uh, you know, a, a little bit of, of, of excitement, a little bit, things are changing. That's fun for a few swings. Now it's gone on for a month. And the novelty wears off. They're beginning to feel the weight of this project. Uh, Not only that, but they are also feeling that there are other things, frankly, that they'd like to be doing. Uh, The seventh month, we know, uh, today in uh, the Hebrew calendar today, and as well as back in the day, it was when there was these flurry of festivals. Uh, It got kicked off on the first of the month. They had the Feast of Trumpets loud music to say something important is going to be happening. Uh, Then on the 10th of the month, they would have uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, this big uh, once, and uh, speaking of the the forgiveness of of God's people, and then you reach the Feast of the Tabernacles. This particular, uh, at this particular time, this was the, the second last day of that Feast of Tabernacles. It was one of three festivals where people were um, required to bring their tithes. And I'm picturing the priests counting up the offerings at the end of this, temp- of this festival, and they realize the finances aren't great. Th- this is not going to go well for us. And, and so uh, that-, that was one of the things going through their minds. It was also the festival when Solomon dedicated the temple. And so as this day comes, and they can't help but uh, think back to that day. There would be readings that would remind them of uh, Solomon's dedication of the temple. They would be thinking about that. They would be looking at their own work and thinking, this, this is never going to be that. Uh, they, they couldn't help but think of uh, how different this was. Solomon had this massive workforce. 
uh, he was able to mobilize not only his own nation, but other nations that, were, uh, that he was, uh, had authority over. Uh, people uh, would be bringing not only taxes, but bringing labor, and they would be giving themselves to it, and they saw uh, dramatic results. Now, the memory of what Solomon accomplished is making them feel really, really small, uh, feeling like what they are doing really doesn't matter. So in verse 3, God questions them. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? It wasn't really the size of the structure that was so underwhelming. It was the fact that it it just looked so plain, and it was going to look plain. Uh, Solomon, they're, they're... Uh, The Bible describes how much gold that he gave to this project and calculated in today's terms, uh, Solomon personally donated $15 billion worth of gold. Just an extraordinary sum. And you had an entire nation that was excited about this work. They gave generously as well. And so uh, not only do you have that, that gold, they had imported workmen, special craftspeople who, who were able to do uh, elaborate and beautiful work. And as people looked back to those days, they just would say, there's no way this is ever going to look like this. And, and, it, and, it, and it affected them. By comparison, the temple the Israelites were building, it, it looked pathetic. Uh, they'd do their best, uh, but as they were going to be slapping things together with two by fours and uh, and drywall, they just realized this project is going to end in an embarrassment. It just is never going to feel uh, significant. It's never going to compare. In Ezra chapter three verse twelve, we get some feeling of how the uh, uh, the exiles would have returned. This was. Uh, a number of years earlier when when they had made the first attempt to lay the foundation. It says, as they began to lay the foundation of the temple, many of the older people who had seen the former temple began to weep. They cried, realizing this is never going to be that. This, this This is reminding us of how small we are. Uh, then in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, uh, he speaks into this same setting and famously talks about those who despised the day of small things. People who, who looked at what was happening and said, boy, this is never going to be the same again. This is so plain and mediocre and meager, and this is all that we are able to accomplish. And so that was the, the, the feeling that was gripping people as uh, they were walking through this time. And I think that Christians deal with these kinds of thoughts all of the time. Maybe you have never put them in these terms before. But let's face it, Solomon's days are long gone. At the time when you had an entire, entire nation of people excited about the things of God and, and, and giving themselves to his purposes, we, just, we don't know those days. The church is often rejected and ignored by the culture here in Canada. Maybe at work you hear people talking about those evangelicals, and you just hope, hope, hope they don't ask you what, what kind of church you go to. Uh, you, you, you feel yourself uh, portrayed in the media and you're like, that's not, that's not who I am. That's, you're, you're, that's a caricature of, of what I believe. And you can't help but feel small as a result. You long for the days when the church was respected. Maybe you long for the days when Christian values were the norm. But the good old days can rob us of a new day today. Focus on what God was used to be doing can keep us from seeing what He is seeking to do uh, in our midst now. Nostalgia can lower our motivation the way it did in Haggai's day. And so can smallness. Our church is small, right? I I I I I, I didn't need to, but I, I checked anyway. Um, last week's video, last week's sermon video was viewed by exactly thirty-one people. 
that's not exactly a, a cultural juggernaut, is it? You can feel small. And, and maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you feel that. Like, I, I read of, of Peter on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches his sermon, and I don't know how much you know, effort he put into it, but like, there were crowds of people, and, and, and he gets to the end, and he doesn't even have to, have to say anything. People are shouting out, well, what do we do? Like, we're, we're cut to the heart. And, and, I, and I, I read that, and I think, I, I don't often get that kind of response. I've never been interrupted partway of a sermon and say, please, put us out of our ministry. I want to respond. It doesn't happen to me. And you can feel small. And, and, and maybe you feel that in your own ministries. Maybe, maybe it just doesn't feel uh, that it's, it's, it's that significant. Maybe you came to serve today as, as an usher or, or to work in our children's ministry. And you, maybe you just think, ah, I don't think anything is important is going to happen. If, if I show up late for my shift today, it probably won't matter because, I don't know, who's going to be there anyway? That, that's what Zechariah calls despising the day of small things. Beginning to think that, oh, if, if it's not big, then it can't be important. You start to assume maybe none of this is all that significant. But history teaches us God is constantly building up and tearing down. God, God cycles through history. We get locked into today and think, oh, it's going to always be like this, or, or maybe it's all, always going to get worse. And not to realize that, that God is regularly breaking out in, in, in new works, doing new things and bringing uh, new uh, works of his grace in people's lives, but in also in generations and times and places. That 10-year-old in your Sunday school class this morning could be the person who sparks the next revival here in our country. That, that uh, person standing in the connection room today, you decide just to walk over and introduce yourself to, to that person, and that conversation could be the means by which that person comes to faith. What happens in our prayer meetings this week could be the means that God uses to bring transformation to our congregation, maybe even our city. There's a recognition that if God matters, then all that we do for God matters. If, if he's important, then any step that we take for him is important. And despising the day of small things can often get in the way of that. So we've looked at the problem. Without the big picture, without stepping back and realizing, no, this is, this is God. If, if it's God... I, I got to give everything to this. I, I, I got to give like this matters. Uh, that's, that's part of the, the, uh, the, the problem. Not seeing the big picture doesn't feel worth it. Nostalgia, smallness can get in the way of our giving what we would otherwise give to our ministries, uh, to our opportunities. And so maybe you say, I don't want to stay there. I, I, maybe I find myself getting into those ruts of, of despising the day of small things. I want to change. I want to, I, want to, I want to not think like that. So Haggai moves from identifying the problem to then dealing with some of the solutions. And the first of those is just look back and believe that God can do it again. When we reminisce about the old days, what we're typically doing in those times is looking at the circumstances and we feel small in comparison. What he, is, what he is telling us to do instead, don't reminisce about the circumstances. Instead, look back and consider the God who brought those things to pass and believe if God doesn't change, then he can and very well may choose to act in such a way again. We look back, we put our focus on God, not the circumstances, and we believe God is God. He can do it again. Now, just to reorient yourselves, again, we're picturing some uh, Jewish exiles. Uh, they have uh, 
they're a month into this uh, building project and it's most, mostly uh, demolition, excavation. It, it's, it's the hard grunt work, little to show for it kind of stage of the work. They're convinced the work isn't really going to amount to much. They feel it's going to end in embarrassment. In verse 4, rather than sympathize with them and say, you know what, you guys have got a point. This is kind of mediocre. Um, maybe we'll just do half shifts. This is it's not, it's not all that significant. Instead of doing that, uh, we instead uh, hear the message from God telling them to get to work. He says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. He's saying, work like it matters. Serve like this is important because it is important. Probably as you are hearing that, some of you who have spent some time over the years reading and rereading the Bible, you'll say, I think I've heard somebody, God say something like that before. And maybe you're thinking back to Joshua. Uh, Joshua 1.9, those, those calls from God to, to be strong, to, uh, to be courageous. Imagine being Moses' successor. He is following in the heels of a giant of the faith. And he's got a big task ahead of him. He's going into the promised land with an army that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. And so all of those, uh, all of, all of those insecurities would be very natural to, uh, the, to be welling up with inside him. And God essentially says, be strong, put away your fears, I'm with you, that's all that matters. And it's the same message that he gives here to uh, the exiles. Uh, he, he gives that same message to those who are doing work, building God's, pen, God, God's, uh, God's temple. And God gives us the same message today. The, the same message to commit yourselves to what God is doing in our midst. He's carrying out a mission and it's all hands on deck. Because of that, what, because we believe what God is doing amongst us is important, because JP, again this Sunday, as we did last Sunday and the Sunday before that and the Sunday before that, telling you, hey, we've got a mission. We believe that God has entrusted a mission to us. And as a result, we believe it's all hands on deck to give ourselves to that mission. So if you've been here long enough to call this church your home, you've been here long enough to be on, uh, on, a, on a ministry team, to be a part of what God is doing to, uh, to build his church and to impact this world. But what, when we hear that message to be strong, to work, uh, to, to believe that it is uh, something that matters, notice where God directs their attention. Look at the end of verse 4 and then in verse 5. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Now, it's been a long time since they've come out of Egypt. This is 520 BC. Maybe we say it's about a thousand years before. Like, it's not like they can remember. Oh, yeah, I remember when that happened. No, he's saying go back in history. Remember, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that was with you in the parting of the seas. Remember the plagues that I, I brought to pass so that you could be rescued, so that you could be delivered. They'd been thinking back. They just hadn't gone back far enough. And typically when we get nostalgic, we don't go back far enough either. We, we'll go back to some period in our recent history and say, oh, I wish it was like that again. He's saying... No, don't just go back to Solomon's days and that's just looking at the result. Go back further to the, the Exodus because that tells you, that points to the cause, to, points to uh, what, what God did in those days. He's saying, do you remember when you were slaves in Egypt? Remember when I caused all of those uh, amazing miracles to take place? That happened because I was with you. It happened because 
we had developed and entered into a relationship with each other. And, and I've committed myself to you. I'm still with you. I'm still in relationship with you. I'm still in your midst. And therefore, you don't need to fear. You, you don't need to, to, to find yourselves giving in to uh, those, those feelings that come up. And the promises to us are even greater in the new covenant. As Paul says in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? There's no feeling small when you walk with a big God. And, and it is a reminder to us in all of those times when we are given to smallness, when we are given to fear, when it just feels too big, too overwhelming, too much for us. To remember that God is with us and it is his presence that has always been the deciding factor in uh, the lifting up and the, the provision for God's people. Remember what he's promised. Remember that he's with us. Remember what he's done in the past. Believe that he can do it again. Believe that God is not finished, but that he is continuing to move his purposes forward. You don't need to just go back to Solomon and think, oh man, if we only had Solomon, this project would be so different. He's saying, forget Solomon. You've got me. And it is my presence in your midst that it is a deciding factor, not some uh, king that uh, you would rather seem to look to. So that's the first place to look for encouragement when you're feeling small. You look back, you believe God can do this again. But then you look forward and believe the best is yet to come. Uh, to, to be clear, uh, God has promised us two things in Scripture. He has promised that in this world we will have difficulty, but he has also promised us a great future. We need to be realistic about one without losing sight of the other. And often we, 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 we're better at, re, at remembering one of those two things. But they're both true. Difficulty in this world, but promised a great future. So we look forward, believe the best is yet to come. Now, starting in verse 6, God says, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now, the Jews hearing these words, they didn't have a country. They were, they were just a tiny little province of, of, of Persia at this point. They didn't have many resources. They, they looked to their bank accounts and they thought, boy, this is beyond this. This is, this is too much for us. And it would be easy to assume that it would always be this way. And, and you know this in your, your own life. You look at circumstances in your life, maybe powerful figures in your life, powerful figures in our nation, in our world, and you figure, it's always going to be this way. I, I'm I'm stuck. And God says, no, I, I, I'm the God who can shake the foundations of this world. Um, if you notice the pairs of uh, heavens and earth, sea and dry land, it's a, God's using a literary term called a merism there. It's where you take two polar opposites to describe everything that comes in between. So when he says uh, the, the, the heavens and the earth, it's a way of saying, I'm going to shake this entire universe. The sea and the dry land, I'm going to take the foundations of this earth and and put it on its head. I'm I'm going to shake everything up. The kings of this world, the people we fear, they're not in control at all. It is ultimately in God's hands and he will shake those foundations when he chooses to. The author of Hebrews says, Uh, quotes this verse to speak of Jesus' second coming. He says, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. He says, This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. It's it's a little bit complicated with the way he describes it, but he's taking this, this quote from Haggai, and he's 
pointing it all the way to, through to Jesus' second coming. And he's saying, one day God will shake our world to its foundations. Everything will be turned upside down. And he is actually going to replace this world with a new heavens and a new earth. He is going to make everything new. And so uh, shaking the things that that, that can be shaken to make room for those things that cannot, which means making room for those uh, things that are eternal. That's what God's long-term plan is. But he's saying, in the meantime, he is carrying out little shakings that are warning shakings. Um, Any of you who have been in a strong earthquake have felt the, oh my goodness, it's, you know, the things that I thought were were firm and unmovable, they can actually be moved. When God says so, this world can be turned upside down. In Haggai's day, uh, he was promising to shake the nations so that uh, the temple uh, building and construction uh, could, could be paid for. He says that the treasures of the nations would come into his temple. Here, the people were looking at their bank statements and thinking, we're going to have to buy the temple furnishings at the dollar store. Like, this is, this is bad. This is not going to be a great project. Like when people from other nations come and they look at our, at our, at our, our, our temple, they're going to be like, oh, like, is that all you can do? Like, that's really not a great thing. And he's saying, no, 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 don't, don't, don't worry about that. I, I am going to shake the nation so that the, 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 the nations end up paying for your temple construction project. And that's exactly what happened. The kings of Persia ended up paying for the construction of this temple. It was Persian gold that ended up ensuring that the exiles weren't building, weren't getting their furnishings from the dollar store, that they were actually going to build something that would be significant. Then, in Roman times, it was the uh, uh, King Herod, who was himself uh, an Edomite, or Idumean, as they called them in, in the first century, a descendant of Esau, uh, one of the nations, ended up using Roman tax money to make, turn this temple into something more glorious than uh, they would ever have imagined. God shook the nations and provided. And the message is, God's not short on funds. God doesn't he isn't limited by us, and he, he isn't uh, at, at the mercy of that. And I think we often forget that. We see the world in terms of what we have and what we can do. And God needed to tell the people in Haggai's day, that's, that's not really the full calculation. And so we can forget that. We can also misunderstand this principle as well, though. What some people do is we figure... If God has all the money, then we don't need to, to budget or to plan or to save. We, like, God's got it all. So, so we don't need to worry about those things. If God's got, a cattle on, got the cattle on a thousand hills, then I don't need to trim my expenses. And that's not how the Bible describes things. God very clearly uses financial needs to teach us faith, to teach us discipline, to teach us Patience, self-control. And so that's a part of God's equation as well. We need to hold in balance God's abundance and our stewardship. We have a long-term vision of what God's resources can accomplish. We believe God is the one who can do whatever he wants to do. We trust him for that and we believe him for that. We ask him for that. But then we have a, a faithful stewardship of what he has entrusted to us. And we, we're content with that. And we are faithful with that. But God's plans aren't small. And his best days aren't all in the past. I think we think that sometimes, right? We, we think, oh, I wish I'd been back there. Nothing's going to happen today. Nothing's probably going to happen this year, next year. And... Just, that's, that's what they were thinking in Haggai's day. They were figuring, I think God's got a best before date, and I think we're past that. It just, 
There's nothing much that we can look forward to, not, not much that we can anticipate. And so God ends his message to the people in verse 9 saying, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. It's going to be better. What, I've, what I have purposed, what I am going to accomplish will be greater. And then he says, and in this place I will give peace. Who in their right mind could have dreamed that this crummy little underfunded construction project would end up being an incredibly uh, opulent uh, piece of architecture that, uh, that, that it would come to be? Who could have possibly guessed that from these small beginnings that God himself would come in the person of Jesus Christ to visit this temple? Who would have guessed that the church would be born from these same temple grounds and that thousands upon thousands would be sent out with a message of hope, uh, bringing about worshipers from every nation, every language, every tongue? And yet that's what happened, right? We know that God did it again. Do you believe that God could do that again here? Does that, is that even a possibility in your thinking? That, oh, maybe God would do that again. Maybe the revival could strike out in our midst here. Like, is, is that a, a part of your calculation? If you believe what Jesus said, that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows and turns into something like that nobody could have anticipated, I think we would have to say, we have to believe that God can do that here, Right? That, that we, we, we have to believe uh, in what God is capable of. And if we believe that, we need to stop despising the day of small things. We need to serve, to witness, to give, as if it matters because God matters. It, it matters because God is on the agenda, and, and anything that God is a part of has to have ultimate significance, ultimate importance. I, I want to I give myself to the things of God. I, I want to get in on what God is doing. And I don't, I don't just because I, I believe in what, what is possible with God, it's not like, oh my goodness, if he doesn't do that, I'm just going to be frustrated and cursing all the time. Well, why doesn't he do that here? No, that's not it, it at all. We believe anything God chooses to do is of infinite importance. And the fact that we get to be a part of it is a privilege. And so we approach it with anticipation, with joy. Now, I felt my age this week. I felt really old. And that's when you say, how old did you feel, Paul? Uh, I felt so old. Uh, I, I felt this old. I, I, I felt so old, I remembered when people were still talking about whether Amazon would ever be profitable or not. Anybody else remember those conversations? Like Amazon was a thing in about the mid-90s, and it kind of going, it's like, boy, that's, that's an interesting thing that they've got going there. Are they ever going to turn a profit, I wonder? And we talked about that. Now it's, a one, it's over a trillion dollar company, but for the first nine years, they didn't make a profit. In Seattle, if you, if you go there, uh, one of the buildings that, that Google has built uh, is called the Wainwright Building. And they named it after their first customer. It was on April 3rd, 1995. A man by the name of John Wainbright, Wainwright paid $27.95 for a page turner of a book called Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies. They built a an office tower, named an office tower after him because he believed in Amazon when nobody else had believed in it yet. He, he thought this could come. Uh, other people were saying, I don't think we could trust that. This whole, the idea of ordering a book online, I don't think that'll ever work. I, I, don't, I, I'm, I feel safer just going to the bookstore. Um, John Wainwright said, no, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, believe in this. I, I'm, I'm putting my trust in this. And 30 years later, 
there's this big tower, big building where they're saying, yeah, we, we need to celebrate those people who believe in things before you get to see them. And in a sense, what we're doing in looking back at the people in Haggai's day is looking at a group of people like John Wainwright, who chose to, as, when they heard a message from God about why this mattered and what was going on, they chose to believe that something, that something was possible that was beyond what they could see in front of them. Now, you know, God has entrusted us with a mission, and the mission is to believe, keep going, connect, and share the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And we believe that mission matters. We believe that if people who don't know Jesus can come to understand the incredible news that there is in the gospel, we think when they trust that message, that they respond in repentance and faith, there's something incredible takes place. And when those people learn to connect with, with God's resources, with God's power, with God's spirit, with, God's, with God through prayer, that, that, that people come alive in their faith. And when they come to share that message, to invest themselves with, in, in fellowship, in service, in, in giving of their, their resources, giving of their, their hope in, in, in sharing the gospel, we think lives are transformed and communities are uh, will never be the same. We think the mission matters. And we're inviting you to be a part of it. And we're inviting you to, to, to believe, to connect, to share. And for those of you who are doing that, who are investing yourself in the mission, and maybe it's feeling like the, the, the sledgehammer portion of the job just feels hard, feels small, doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere, doesn't feel like it's all that important, to remind yourself that it matters because God matters. To remind yourself that, that there, yeah, there's a line. Uh, we, we, could, we could jump off of either side of this, but I'm going to hold in, in tension God's abundance and my stewardship. I'm going to find my strength in God's presence. And I'm not going to feel small because I walk with a big God. Let's turn to him now in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for this grand vision of who you are and what you're doing. Forgive us for despising the day of small things. Everything that you do is important. Every way that we get to partner with you is significant. Help us to be a people who don't just look back, but press forward. Open our eyes to what you can accomplish in and through us. Help us to see the importance of small opportunities, small interactions. Help us to see the value of small people, babies, and toddlers, and children, and youth. Give us anticipation at what mustard seeds can grow into. And remind us of your presence and your power as you work in our midst. For we ask you in Jesus' powerful name.